blocks. And we need them to um, figure out how the geodynamo works and how, how evolution through time has happened. But if we want to understand from a planetary perspective how geodynamos can actually be created, um, we have to look at something that's even a little bit more, even older, um, and that's meteorites. So different types of meteorites can give us different information so that mm -hmm. undifferentiated ones give us could potentially record magnetic field in the solar nebula during the formation of that meteorite. And differentiated ones can then record dynamo processes that might have happened in those planetesimals. But as, oops, um, every meteorite has seen at least one pressure event. So pressure is actually a quite, a, quite a, um, important part in the paleontology work on, on meteorites. And different meteorites come from different parts of the planet. So we have iron meteorites, which are from the from a planetesimal core, and we have rocky meteorites that come from the planetesimal's crust. But overall, we don't really know where they're actually from, so which depth the meteorite comes from when they're, they're blasted apart in space. And the problem is that it depends on um, some of them will be pressurized. If you imagine the meteorite here hitting this object, these will be highly pressurized, while the stuff that is in the middle might actually decompress. So there are different processes involved in the creation of meteorites. And why is pressure that important is um, if you have very large pressures, you can see that you actually see cracks in the minerals. When we go down in pressure, you can see planar deformation features and, 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 and things like this. And the lower the, the pressure is, the less we actually see in the, of these pressure indicators. That at about 5 GPA, there are no petrographic indicators left. So everything that is considered unshocked might still have seen up to 5 GPA of pressure. And we know that pressure has quite an impact on the magnetic remnants of uh, samples. So what we consider unshocked may have still have seen 5 GPA of pressure. So we are investigating um, pressures in this very low range. So pressure can affect the remnant magnetization. Um, on the left here, you can see um, SRM moment as it is pressure demagnetized. So this is the first effect that we mainly see in, um, due to pressure. We um, give these single domain magnetites an SRM moment, and with increasing pressure, we start to demagnetize this moment. If we then give it another IRM moment, you can see that even at the decompression, we start losing this moment. So it doesn't really matter if we're pressurizing or decompressing, we still lose some of the magnetic information that is stored in the meteor. The second, um, the second part is piezo-enhanced magnetization. And here you can see an SRM moment at 170 millitesla. Also, we, we start to compress the, the crystal. This time it's, it's multi-domain magnetite, it's inside of a diamond anvil cell, and you see that as we increase pressure and apply new SRM moments, these in actually increase with pressure, meaning we make better magnets. So this would also have an effect on paleointensity recording. So on the one hand, we lose magnetization. On the other hand, we actually make the recorder, uh, make the sample a better recorder after we pressurized it. I don't really think I need to talk much about the Telia method, as we've seen it uh, a couple of times, but I have the slides, so I'll talk about it. Um, so in the Telia method, which is probably the most robust method to actually get to absolute paleo intensities, uh, we try to replace the natural remnant magnetization with the thermal remnants that we acquire in a non magnetic field in the laboratory. We can then plot the PTRM that is acquired in the lab versus the NRM that is still remaining in the rock, and we can fit a straight line through the points if, if everything goes well. And the slope of, those, of this line is then related to the paleo intensity of the rock during formation. So what would those two effects of pressure do to our paleo intensity? So this is a very basic um, array diagram 
with perfect recorders. And assuming we have a one-to-one -one line, pressure demagnetization would remove some of the magnetization and the initial magnetization, thereby lowering the slope of the fit and lowering the paleo intensity. On the other hand, if we have this Pienzio enhanced magnetization, we would make a better recorder, increase the magnetization at the final PGRM steps, again, lowering the paleo intensity by lowering the slope of the fit. So these two effects we're trying to figure, figure out and if they actually play a role. So since I can't really use meteorites to do these experiments, I have to heat my samples quite a lot of times. I had to find something similar and I chose a natural obsidian from, from Le Paris. Um, mm -hmm. It has been studied before by Roman Leonhard and is, uh, is known to be a fairly good paleo intensity recorder. It has a very high stability and this is what I need. So the thermal reversibility is very high. These are three thermal curves done on a, on a VFUB, one to 200 to 400 and to 600 degrees and you can see they're basically perfectly reversible. The curie temperature is a little low, so we have a little bit of titanium in there, which is nice because it reflects some of the um, magnetic mineralogy of some achondritic meteorites. And the domain state is about in the pseudo single domain range, which you can see on, on this history. We wanted to see if hydrostatic versus non-hydrostatic pressure has an effect. Therefore, we have two different sample groups. Each of them comprise of 10, uh, 20 samples. And we wanted to see if the pressure direction in, in comparison to the NRM direction actually has an effect. So we have these two groups are divided of um, 10 samples that are magnetized perpendicular to the pressure axis and 10 samples that are magnetized per, uh, parallel to it. And we all, all of the samples get an artificial TRM in a 35 microtesla field that we then try to recover during the experiments. The first, um, but first I want to show you how, how we actually apply the pressure. So we have uh, six millimeter mini cores that get put in this Teflon cup with the pressure medium. Depending on if we have hydrostatic or non-hydrostatic pressure, it's either silicon oil for hydrostatic or rock salt for non-hydrostatic. This is then closed up and put into this stainless steel high pressure vessel. So it's sitting just in the middle here. And that is put into a hydraulic press where we can apply up to 10 tons of force, which relates to about two GPA of pressure. So we, we're trying to, to have the application and release of pressure as uh, homogeneous as possible. But as you can see, this is quite a crude instrument. It's, it's a little more difficult. And we're actually planning on doing more work on the, at the IRM where we actually have a press that has a, a where you can define ramping rates, which will be nice. The first thing I wanted to look at is how the, the coercivities of the sample are affected by pressure. So the first thing, we, I give an SRM moment and then I have to magnetize it. So these uh, curves are done on the sushi bar in Munich and you can see um, very nice. I would have taken ages to do this by hand. And then um, after the AF, I give it a new iron moment and I pressurize it. And I've done this successively to pressures up to 1.2 GPA. And you can see that as we increase in pressure, so this is the 0.2 GPA value, we lose some of the magnetic <laughs> moment and we demagnetize parts that are, have coercivities up to about 40 micro. As we increase in pressure, we demagnetize more and we also demagnetize parts that have higher coercivities. So meaning pressure demagnetization affects mostly the lower coercivities, but the higher the pressure is, the higher the coercivity that are actually affected. If we plot the, the demagnetization of the IRM um, versus pressure, you can see that we lose about 43% per GPA of an IRM moment, which is quite a lot just to see if there are any irreversible changes in the magnetic um, minerals, which could happen if there were cracks forming, so you have new uh, pinning for domain walls and things like this. I did a no, no pressure IRM AF demagnetization after each pressure step, and you can see the, the IRM 
only changes very little, if at all. So I think first, on one hand, um, pressure enhanced magnetization doesn't really play a role, but also we don't really change anything in the magnetic mineralogy. If we then normalize this to the to the initial value, you can see that by pressure demagnetizing, we actually increase the, the median destructive field from 36 microtesla to about 70 microtesla by only 1.2 GPA. So we're really removing the lower coercivity components of the sample. But of course, we want to look at uh, paleo intensity and here um, the average of all 20 hydrostatic samples. So I'm always gonna plot the average of them all because they're very homogeneous. If you can see the shaded area here is one standard deviation of the normalized values. So they're very homogeneous between um, each sample. And there are no differences between the X and the Z magnetized samples. So there's no, no change. It doesn't really matter for hydrostatic press, uh, hydrostatic stress if the magnetization is along or perpendicular the pressure axis, which is some of what we would expect. The samples demagnetize very sharply in about 50 degrees, which also is a bit of a problem for the furnace. So the temperature control has to be fairly good, and, uh, but it works out fairly nice. So I think this is a good example. As we then apply pressure, some of the NRM moment is removed, and it actually is removed up to about 450 Celsius. And after this, the thermal demagnetization is, follows the same curve as, as, as it did in the zero pressure. I have to stress that these are the same samples. So the samples have been magnetized fresh, then pressurized. So we're not looking at a sister sample, but these are always the same sample. So at 0.6 GPA, we lose about 8% of, of um, the NRM moment. What's interesting is that the PGRM acquisition actually doesn't change at all. Like there's a little, little bit here, but that might more be of a problem in the, in the furnace. But, but the overall PGRM acquisition at 560 degrees then is the same as for the non-pressurized one. So we really don't, change, don't have any piezo-enhanced magnetization. If we increase the pressure a little further, again, these are the same samples. We're removing even more of the magnetization. We're <coughs> about 15%, but we also remove more of the higher unblocking temperatures. So we're removing, as with the coercivities, where we remove higher coercivities, we now remove higher unblocking temperatures. However, the PGRM acquisition doesn't change. And similarly, if we go to the last pressure step, which is 1.8 GPA, we lose about 20% of the moment, and there is no change in PGRM acquisition. However, we lose moment up to much higher temperatures. So we can look at an array diagram. Again, this is the average for all 20 hydrostatic samples. So the shaded area is the standard, one standard deviation. And you can see that there's slight curvature which is what we would expect for, uh, for pseudo single domain grains. And if we use all points and fit the straight line, we get about the right result, which is nice. But you might say, well, you know, you have curvature, why not only fit the last few points? If we do that, we underestimate the pitting intensity by about 10%. So the first to last version here is the way to go. So now we can compare this to the to the post-pressure intensity. So the black one then is still the zero pressure. We have 0.6, 1.2, and 1.8. And you can see that the, the best fit line really is lowered with increasing pressure. And thereby we, we reduce the failure intensity from 35 to 33 to 30 to about 29. So we are really losing um, paleo intensity by removing the first few, uh, the first NRM moments. The nice thing here is that I can really compare what we would have in, in, normal, in the normal world. We find a rock and we normalize it to the initial NRM value because we don't know the, the previous, the pre-shock value. But I do, so I can 
normalize it to the theorem, the one that is actually given prior to uh, pressurization. And you can see that here the P theorem acquisition really doesn't change up from a certain temperature onwards. So lower pressures remove the first. So the, the main change is in the first few temperature steps and the higher the pressure, the higher the changes actually go. Now we can look at the difference between hydrostatic and non-hydrostatic stress. So on the left is the, the same plot I've shown you already. This is the hydrostatic stress with the silicon oil where we lose about 6% of the magnetization. On the right, we have much higher standard deviations because the stress is less, less well controlled. And we have much higher demagnetization of the, um, of the NREM moment. And you really have to think it's in, in an impact, will the stress be hydrostatic or will it be somewhat non-hydrostatic? So I think in a meteorite setting, will the, the demagnetization will be somewhere in between the two. The interesting thing is that we gain about 3% of moment in the first heating step, which doesn't seem a lot. But if I show you the array diagram, um, this actually makes a difference because in the hydrostatic ones, the pressure demagnetization and the lowering of the pillion intensity are about equal, while for the non-hydrostatic ones, this, this gain of the moment in the first step actually makes the, so we lose less pillion intensity, even though we lose more NRM moment. But you can also see that this is a much stronger, stronger um, shallowing of the slope than for the hydrostatic stress. So we can put this all into one graph. So here we have the, the pressure demagnetization. And as we look at it in terms of pressure, we can see that the higher the pressure, the more we actually demagnetize the sample, which is what, what we would expect. And we lose about 10% per GPA. So this is not a very strong effect in these samples. The non-hydrostatic ones, while they're much more scattered, also lose much more of the actual NRM moment. So we lose about 20%. From the calculated paleo intensity, so here this is the lab field which we're trying to recover and the zero pressure, um, both zero pressure ones actually recover it with an error, which is nice. And as we increase in pressure, we see that the paleo intensity is lowered um, and it's more, it's, it's more lowered in the non-hydrostatic pressure, but not quite as much as we would expect from just from the pressure demagnetization. So the initial premise was that the amount of pressure demagnetization would relate to the, to the amount of um, lowering of paleo intensity. And this is exactly what we see. So if we kind of of the calculated paleo intensity versus the pressure demagnetization, we see that there's a fairly nice linear relationship. Interestingly, also with increasing pressure, we are, decre we are decreasing the standard deviation of the best fit slope, meaning that we increase the quality of the data, which has possibly two implications. One, that sometimes you'll do paleo intensity on a meteorite, and you'll think, ooh, this is a really nice array plot, even though it might just be because it's been pressure demagnetized. So you might overestimate the quality of your, of your data. On the other hand, this might actually be used to clean some of the multi-domain components prior to a um, intensity experiment. So maybe this can be used, and this is what I'm going to work on when we hit the IRM in the next step. So let's conclude. Um, so stress affects grains with lower unblocking temperatures more. The higher the stress, the higher the unblocking temperature that is actually affected. Hydrostatic stress lowers the paleo intensity uh, proportional to the pressure demagnetization. And hydrostatic stress is less affecting than non-hydrostatic. And again, we're not, we don't expect a purely hydrostatic to blast apart this um, the planetesimal. So the take-home message is 
Paleo intensities derived from stressed materials can only be taken as lower limits. From the stress demagnetization, we can see that the, um, the strain actually mostly affects the lower coercivities. Again, more the multi-domain parts of the remnants are affected. And that an SRM is affected much more than an TRM, which is also kind of what we would expect. So and all these experiments have been done at, at room temperature. But I wouldn't expect room temperature, like the pressure to actually happen at room temperature. So I've done experiments where I did AF demagnetization at elevated temperatures, and it really removes much more of the moment than it, is, uh, it does at room temperature. So I expect this to be uh, also much greater at elevated temperatures, which is also something that I'd like to do in the future stages of this project. So thank you very much. This is actually the project I'm going to work on at the IRM. So we we have a NSF grant funded, thank you, um, to actually do this. So this will be. We don't really understand why this. It seems to work quite well. So I actually have one more figure. So, so this is the zero pressure failure intensity of one of the samples. And after pressure cycling, you can see it's much more linear. So it's really, it really works. And if we use this, the, the amount of pressure demagnetization to correct for this, so this is now the corrected, <coughs> the corrected paleo intensity, we start to recover the correct paleo intensity. I, it has been pointed out that we are only doing it once, and that might not be the way to do it. Um, which is something we're, we're still uh, working on. But at least this was an outcome that we didn't expect, and it seems to work. We just need to figure out why it works. Actually, what I wonder, where is, where is the true strain intensity? Because uh, at uh, zero pressure, you get some uh, considerable grains, mm -hmm. which probably affect the temperature. So you can't really compare the low pressure to the high pressure level in terms of quality of heat. Well, we, we take all points. We know that there is no thermal alteration. We know all the effects of the curvatures only due to multi-domain or yeah. pseudo-single domain. So you wouldn't do this in, in, if you had a natural sample, so you would probably not use the first few steps and just use this, which would then underestimate your intensity by about 10%. But since we know there is no thermal alteration, um, I think at least for this to, to try it out works quite well. Yeah, figure it somewhere. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. Sorry, sorry. So I was thinking if you apply the the measure that is applying the stress like this angle. Well, it did make a little bit of a difference for the non hydrostatic samples. So there was a little bit more demagnetization when the moment was parallel to the stress axis, but it didn't make any difference at all for a hydrostatic, which is kind of what you would expect because pressure is coming from all sides. So you wouldn't really expect any difference. So, and the difference for the non-hydrostatic ones weren't, wasn't that great, so. More <laughs> So, um, for the example, the majority of the terrain is very fine, so you only need 1.2 to get the So, I was wondering if you have, let's say, some regular soft that has a wider distribution, like one side. What's the pressure? Uh, you know, 
Well, I'm actually working just on that. I have basalt samples with a much larger grain size, so they're more multi-domain than these are. I chose these to be not multi-domain. Um, so, I, and I pressurized them to one GPA, expecting them to about demagnetize to about 10%, but they demagnetized between 50 and 80%. So I probably went a little too far. So if you really want to remove some of the multi-domain moments, it might, might be useful to not go as high. Maybe 0.5 GPA is enough. But yeah, this we have to work on that. So for uh, a pure single domain uh, handling uh, samples, um, so if, if it was you apply a pressure in that position on top of that, I have not tried this with pure single domain, but if that is true, then you wouldn't see any effect. But I haven't done it. Any other questions? Well, thank you. Thanks. Okay.